Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. Well, hey, we're going to continue on uh, this morning in the book of Ephesians. Our church has been in a series this past summer. We're going through the book of Ephesians. We're calling this series E-Files. And here's kind of the idea is each week we're just taking a little file, if you will, out of the book of Ephesians, a little passage of scripture, and we're kind of dissecting it, cutting it up, and seeing what the word of God has to say to us uh, from the book of Ephesians. I want to start by making a statement. As your pastor, this really isn't in my notes, but I just want to say this. I kind of was thinking about this as I was praying this morning and preparing to preach today, and that is this. I sense, I truly sense that right now God is working in a very real way in the hearts of some people in our church, in all of our campuses, in all of our locations. I'm hearing stories from our campus pastors. I'm hearing things on Facebook. I'm creeping on some of you guys and watching what's going on in your life. No, I'm seriously, I, I really sense that God is working in some people's lives. Now, on, on the front side, that sounds really good, and that's awesome, and it is, but let me tell you, there's, a, there's another side of that. You ready for this, church? When, when God is working, anywhere you see God moving and working, there's an enemy that's going to show up to oppose and resist. And so here's the other thing i got to say with that. Some of you are really going through it right now. You really are. Some of you are up against it in your life, maybe in your marriage, maybe in your finances, maybe in your health, because God is doing some stuff. You're getting close to making a decision that could be very life-changing in a good way, and the enemy is there to throw darts to oppose. And so I'm just saying this. What if, what if God actually brought you here today to Flandreau, to Coleman, to Deeside, to our iCampus? What if God actually brought you to one of our locations today because you were the one that he wanted to say something to? I mean, I know it's easy sometimes in church to be like, oh, I hope that guy sitting in front of me is listening to this. This is really good. He needs this, right? But what if if God wanted to say something to you this morning? I think he does. I think God has something that he wants to speak into the lives of his children today, and it could be you that he has in the crosshairs of his scope, and he's going to pick you off today. All right, I want to boil this down very simply, okay? I'm speaking right now to a large group of people in multiple locations. I'm speaking to men. I'm speaking to women. I'm speaking to people from varying different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, some very wealthy, some not so wealthy. I'm speaking to people from different religious backgrounds. I'm speaking to people from different political persuasions. I'm speaking to Vikings fans and Packers fans and people down in Jamaica who don't know who the Vikings or Packers even are. I'm speaking to a lot of different little groups of people, but I want to simplify it and boil it down to two groups of people that I'm speaking to today. I don't want to address you both because if you cut through all the clutter, very simply put, there are two categories of people that are listening to this right now. And I want to, I want to make it very simple. I am speaking to people this morning that at some point in your life, you have made a decision of your will to place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have surrendered to his authority. You've acknowledged his lordship over your life. You've accepted his free gift of eternal life that he gives, that he bought for you on the cross when his blood was shed to pay for all of the junk in your life and all of your sin. And at some point in your life, some of you it was decades ago when you were a little kid. Some of you it might have been three weeks ago. But I'm speaking to people who who would say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Not just I believe in God. Even the demons believe in God and shudder, the Bible says you don't get brownie points for believing in God. I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? I'm just going to say, throw down and say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So I'm just going to say, I want to see a show of hands. Who would raise their hand this morning and say, that's me? I am an unashamed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. My assumption was, you can put your hands down, that I'm speaking to many people. And what I want you to know is that everything I'm getting ready to say is directed squarely at you. The other category of people that I'm speaking to today are people who, for whatever reason, have not yet stepped over that line of faith in your life, and you're not yet a follower of Jesus. Maybe some of you are there passively, and what I mean by passively is you're just kind of like, I don't know about all this Jesus stuff, I'm just really not going to make a decision, and to not make a decision, you therefore have made a decision, which is that up to this point, I'm not in the family of God yet, I'm really not a follower of Jesus, and and so you just kind of are passively going, I don't know about this stuff. And I might be speaking to others that are actively resisting a relationship with Jesus, and you, you are angry about all of this Jesus stuff, and you're not here even because you want to be. Someone made you come, your husband made you come, your wife made you come, whatever, and you don't really even want to be here. And I just want to say, regardless of why you're here, I'm glad you're here. 
And are you ready for this? If you're not a follower of Jesus, I am going to direct something at you today, but most of what I'm getting ready to say, you're not even on the hook for. So you can just sit there and sit back and go, see, this is why I'm not one of these followers of Jesus, because they, they do some really weird stuff. They follow some really strange teachings. It's a bunch of rules, do's and don'ts, because you're going to hear some of that today. And you're not on the hook for any of it, because you're not under the authority of Christ yet. We'll, we'll get to that at the end and why that's a problem. So I will come back to you. I just want you to know for like 90% of what I'm going to say this morning, I'm not talking to you. And church, this is important. Sometimes the church is guilty of of, of wanting non-believing people to act like Christians when we struggle enough to have Christians act like Christians. You know what I mean? And so this is time for God's people to police themselves and say, Let, let's, let's live out of our identity of who we are in Christ and, and not, not ask unsaved people who don't claim to know and follow Jesus to act like they know and follow Jesus. Okay, so that's kind of that's where we're going in our time together. I want to remind you as we open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 where we've been because here's the, here's the thing. If all we were to do is open this little passage of Scripture and just look at this one little piece that we're going to look at today, you would walk away going, man, this is just a bunch of rules. It's a bunch of do's and don'ts. But that's why it helps to kind of back up and get the bigger view of what's happened so far in the book of Ephesians. So just a quick little synopsis here where we've been. Ephesians has six chapters. The first three are very theological, where Paul is unpacking and building this case about who we are in Christ. Ephesians was written to believers. It was written to Christ's followers. And he takes three chapters to unpack the, 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 the theological truth of who we are as children of God, who is our identity, who are we in Christ. And it's all about what Jesus Christ did for us when he hung on a cross in our place. It's all about what he did out of his love for us and out of his grace and his mercy for us. It's not about what we bring to the table. It's about who we are as children of the Most High God who've been forgiven of our sin, who've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Now, then in, in chapter 4, Paul turns the corner and he starts to get very practical. Verse 1 of chapter 4, he basically says, I, I want you to walk in light of all that Christ has done for you. I want you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And then the next three chapters get extremely practical where Paul basically is saying, because of who you are and your identity in Christ, this is how you ought to live. And then he just gets into some very practical stuff, but check this out. If you miss chapters one through three about who you are in Christ and your identity in Christ, if all you focus on is how to practically live it out, you will become a legalistic rule follower. Because what you need to understand is that all of my behavior over here ought to be influenced by my identity over here. That I live out of my identity of who I am in Christ, and then it actually changes my behavior over here. If all you do is focus on changing your behavior without embracing your new identity in Christ, you'll just become a religious Pharisee. That's not a good word, by the way. That's like a swear word. To just be a religious Pharisee who's good at following rules. And the, a relationship with Christ is not about following rules. It's about living out of my identity in Christ that actually changes my behavior. And in the last few weeks, you know, Chase has been preaching, doing a great job about unpacking. Paul gets into just practical, like, relationships, how we do relationships with one another. If I'm a Christ follower, it ought to change my relationships with people. There's just so much practical stuff. For those of you that are married, I believe next week, yeah, I think it's next week, at the end of chapter 5, we get into marriage stuff. So if you're struggling in your marriage, get to God's house next week. If you've got a perfect marriage, get to God's house next week because it ain't going to be perfect for long, all right? You've only been married like a week and it's going to change. I'm just telling you, okay? So get to God's house. It's going to get very practical. Today, here's what I'm going to do. We're going through not a small passage of scripture. We're going through 20 verses. That's a big, everyone say, wow, wow, 20 verses. Don't leave yet. Don't run for the door, okay? I'm going to try and get through it somewhat Quickly, I'm just going to read through it. Here's how I'm going to cut this up today. We're going to dissect this. You may notice on your handouts, if you picked one up on the way into one of our campuses, uh, I actually took the liberty for you of we're going to divide this passage of Scripture very practically into two different commands. There's going to be positive commands. In this Ephesians 4, Paul has been talking about like this terminology of we need to put on our new life in Christ, and then he talks about we need to put off our old life in sinful darkness, actually it's the other way around. You start by putting off the old sinful nature and you start by, and then put on the new life in Christ. So as I read through the scripture, I'm just going to get very practical. We're going to see positive commands where Paul is saying, do this, put this on, do these things. And we're going to see him give negative commands that says, 
don't do these things, put off these things, avoid these things. And my prayer is, my guess is that as we read through this, the Holy Spirit's going to do his job, and he's just going to speak to some hearts as we read through this passage of Scripture. Are you ready to go? Say yes. yes. All right. Wasn't very believable, but let's go anyway. All right, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. He starts right off with a positive command. Be imitators of movie stars. Is that what he says? Make athletes, professional athletes, your heroes and role models and do what they do. That will land you in debt and in prison, probably. All right? Be imitators of who? God. Positive command. He's our model. That's a high calling, isn't it? We're, we're, we're to model our life after Christ. Be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children... Oh, here's another positive command. Walk in the way of what? Walk in the way of love. It's a positive command. I want you to put on the love of Christ and live that out. Walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But among you, here comes a negative command. Let's go over here. Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity, put off sexual immorality, put off impurity, or of greed, put off greed. Why? Because these are improper for God's holy people. I just want to pause here real quick, and all the parents are already freaking out because they're like, oh, we got kids in the audience, what's he going to talk about? Let me just say this, let me just say this. Instead of going too deep into the, this subject, let me say, instead of going into all of what we could talk about under the heading of sexual impurity, let me just define sexual purity. We'll just start there. And here's, according to the Word of God, this is sexual purity, is God defines sex as a gift that he gave. Did you know that it was his idea? It's a gift that he gave to this sacred institution and covenant called marriage that he defines as one man and one woman. Until death do we part. That's what we see four times in Scripture. Jesus quoted it uh, once. It's re pre repeated three other times in Scripture. Therefore, sh for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's biblical marriage. And inside that covenant, inside that safety fortress, God says, this is my gift to your marriage. It's an awesome wedding present. Thank you, Jesus. It's my gift to your marriage. It is for intimacy, for oneness, for unity, for building up a, a, a family unit. There it is. Anything outside of that is a perversion of what I have created. And I believe it's time that the church of Jesus stop yelling into the culture about how the culture's not towing the line and how the culture who doesn't claim to know and love Jesus needs to clean it up in the bedroom when it's high time that God's people clean it up in their own lives first. Instead of asking the question, well, how close can I get to the line without crossing the line? Young people, hear me on this. That should not be your standard for sexual purity is how far can I go? How far is until I've crossed the line and it's too far? You're asking the wrong question. Uh, under this heading, let me just say this as well, that, that, that it's not just physical, that, that that's not the only form of sinning and, 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 and putting on sexual impurity is through physical acts. I, I believe that, that Scripture also speaks to our eyes and to our minds as well. And without taking too much time and going too in-depth with, 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 with the audience I have this morning, let me just say this. I believe if the statistics are true, and if the numbers don't lie, I believe I am speaking to Christian men this morning that are being defeated daily in your life because of the sexual impurity you're bringing into your life through your eyes and through what you view. And I believe that God brought some young men here today and some old men here today to hear a word that says, put that off. There must not be a hint of sexual impurity among you. These are improper for God's holy people. You're hearing lies about what sex should be inside your marriage. You're hearing lies about the objectification of women, that they just simply exist as objects to, to, to promote lust within you. And that's, that's what they're there for. And it's, it's bringing havoc into your marriage. Married or not, young guys, hear this. Whether you're married or not, it's, it's messing you up, and it's, it's time we put it off. And ladies, just so I'm not beating up solely on the guys, I think ladies have, have another in, in your lives. And you're not visual as much, so it's not so much playing out there. It's through these, these romance novels. It's through the Fifty Shades of Grey where you, you compare your husband to this amazing man inside this, the stories of this book. And it's the same thing. You're comparing your husband to someone who doesn't exist, and then you just look at this 
doofwad that, that you've married, and you're like, he's not like the guys in these books. Well, they're not real. Just like the ladies in the pictures are not real. They're somebody's daughter, mind you. But the message they're selling is not real. It's not true. And so I'm just saying, it's time for God's people to clean it up. Amen? And it's time that we stop screaming out into the culture about how they need to clean it up and being shocked that Hollywood produces movies like they produce. Let's just clean it up in the church and see where it goes from there. Put off sexual impurity. Greed. He goes on to say this, verse 4, nor should, here's another negative command, nor should there be obscenity, put off obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather, here's a positive command, rather thanksgiving. I find it interesting that twice in this passage, Paul's going to mention the importance of being grateful and having a heart of gratitude and being a thankful person. Gratitude will do a lot for your spiritual walk with God instead of always focusing on what you don't have and what you're entitled to and what the world owes you to start focusing on all that you have to be thankful for and grateful for. If you need help with that, join me on my next trip down to Deeside. We'll introduce you to some people that make it day in and day out with far, far, far less than what we have. Thanksgiving, something we should put on. Verse 5, he says, For of this you can be sure. By the way, to those unbelievers in the house, I'm going to come back to this. This, this is the one part I want you to see, and we'll, we'll come back to it, but, but pay attention. Check back in for a minute. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Here comes a neg another negative command. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Don't be deceived. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. I think what Paul is saying is this. Don't surround yourself with voices that basically say, hey, it doesn't matter how you live. It, it doesn't matter if, if this stuff is true in your life. It really doesn't matter how you live. It does matter how we live. That's why Paul is saying what he's saying. It actually matters how we live. It does. Don't, don't be fooled, don't be misled by people that say, it's cool to be disobedient to the will and to the, to the word of God. It's not cool. He even goes on to say this, verse 7, Therefore, do not be partners with them. I, I want to speak very briefly to this. Um, the, the, the Second Corinthians, there's a passage also written by Paul to another church in another time and place, a church in Corinth. Paul said this, he said that we should not be unequally yoked with non-believers. And here he's saying, don't even partner, don't be partners with the darkness. Well, what does that mean? I think one very, um, very real application of that passage of scripture is that you can apply it to marriage. Don't be married as a follower of Jesus Christ, knowingly, openly walking into a marriage relationship with someone who does not love Jesus more than they love you. Because darkness and light is not going to work well. Bringing the two together in a covenant called marriage. Don't partner don't be unequally yoked. And so let me just bring this down to where the teenagers are at. Young people, single people, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. Listen, I think what that means is that you should not even be dating someone who does not love Jesus more than they love you. You say, well, that sounds really extreme. I'll be the loneliest girl in school if I don't date guys that don't love Jesus more than me. Then it's worth waiting for. Because I'm telling you, young, young people, you want, you want to set yourself up for a hard Hard marriage. You want to set yourself up for practicing for a future divorce. You marry someone. You date people and you marry someone who's not a believer. That's why we date anyway. I, often, I love asking teenagers that. Why do you date? Why do we date people? Because it's cool? Because you need a boyfriend if you're in school? You need a girlfriend if you're in school? No. We, we date people because ultimately you're looking to find a life's mate. Therefore, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's why we date. So if you're dating someone who's not marriage material, stop dating them, like yesterday. You don't need a boyfriend. If they're not marriage material, then why are you dating them? And, and when you get into that, then let's date in very healthy, God-honoring ways. And, and if you look to our culture and to, you know, teen magazines to help you figure that out, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna, they're going to lead you astray. Okay, don't be partners with the darkness. He's going to go on and say more about this, this concept, light versus darkness, okay? Verse 8, he says, For you once were darkness. Guys, you once lived here before you came to know Christ. You were darkness. Now you are light in the Lord. And here comes a positive command. Live as children of the light. 
Live as children of light. And he's going to even go on to describe what this looks like. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. If we're walking in the light, if we're living in the light, we, we, we're doing things that are good, that are righteous, that are true. And then look at this, another positive command. He says, find out what pleases the Lord. How do you do that? How do you do that? I mean, God actually wants me to find out what pleases him. Let me just suggest that if you become a student of this book, you will find out what pleases the Lord. God will speak to you very clearly. He will reveal his will for your life through this. That's why it's so important that you daily spend time in the word of God, because God will tell you what he likes and what he doesn't like. He'll tell you what pleases him. Okay, verse 11, he says this, have nothing to do, negative command, put this off, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Have nothing to do with darkness. Here's a positive command, but rather expose them. Positive command, expose the darkness. Let's talk about that for just a minute. What does it mean to expose the darkness? I think I know what it means. I think what Paul is saying here is that he wants Christians to walk around in, in your life and the minute you see something that is out of line with God's light and with God's truth, you carry a big Bible, much bigger than this one, preferably under your arm. And then when you see darkness, you pull it out and whoosh, hit someone upside the head with it and expose the darkness. Heathen! Is that what you think what he's saying? I don't think that's what he's saying. That just makes you look like a hypocrite with a really big Bible. I think the best way of exposing the darkness is by letting the light of Jesus shine through your life. Point is, you don't have to run around blowing the whistle on the darkness all the time. Sinner, sinner, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. I think that simply by letting the light of Jesus shine through your life, you will take the light of Christ into a dark world. And simply by showing up, you'll expose the darkness. Now, let me, let me just back up a minute and say this. I believe there, there is a time, I mentioned earlier, let the redeemed of the Lord, what? Say so. One of you knows that. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I believe there is a time where God will call upon his children to stand up and to speak up and to say something and to expose an injustice or to expose a, 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 something that's dark and not true. But all I'm saying is this. I think so often we could just take the light of Jesus by, by living out in our communities, in our schools, in our jobs, in our families, Monday through Saturday, the same way we talk in church on Sunday. And that would just do wonders to expose the darkness and to take the light of Jesus into a dark world. He goes on to say this, verse 12, it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. Verse 13, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Again, all I think Paul is saying here is this, let the light of Jesus shine in you. This little light of mine. I'm not going to sing the rest of the song, okay? This little light of mine, I will let it shine. We, we, we talk about it from the time we're little. And the only rule with the light is don't put it in your nose, okay? Other than that, get the light of Jesus out and let it shine for the world to see. Because when you do that, instead of hiding it under a bushel, no, you let it shine. That's so good. That, that wasn't in my notes. That just came to me just like that. That's, that's how my mind works. Thank you, Lord. Okay? Verse 15, here's a positive command. He says, be very careful then how you live. You do need to be careful how you live. How you live matters. I just had a conversation with a guy this past week from our church. He came to me and said, I've got a guy at my job who claims to be a Christian and probably is a Christian, but he's a little bit off because he says this. He says that it's impossible for me to sin because Jesus dealt with all my sin, therefore I can't sin. I don't think that's true. I think it matters how we live. I think our sin has been forgiven. Jesus dealt with all of it. We can totally be forgiven and walk in the grace and mercy of Jesus, but it still matters how we live. We'll, we'll come back to that and talk more about it. He says, be careful how you live. Here's a negative command. Not as unwise. Don't live unwisely. Positive command, but as wise. Live wisely. Wisdom. Here's another positive command, making the most of every opportunity. And he tells us why. Because the days are what, church? Because the days are evil. How many of you knew we're living in evil times? If your hand's not in the air, you are not paying attention. 
or you don't have children or something, okay? Like, uh, we are living in evil times. I'm kidding about the kid thing a little bit. Uh, Turn on the news for crying out loud, church. We are living in historic times. Not not only nationally, but just in the grand scheme of things about the end times and and prophecy and some of this, and I'm not going to get all down into that today. I'm just saying, pay attention, This is not a time for the church to be lulled to sleep playing with your electronic gizmo and gadget. Like You need to be paying attention to what's happening in our world because we are living in evil days and we're commanded to make the most of every opportunity. I believe our generation gets to be a part of maybe one of the final harvests for the kingdom before it all comes down. Now you're like, oh, you, you are crazy, man. I'm just telling you this. I'm not standing here claiming for a second to know when Jesus Christ is coming back and when all of this end time stuff is going down. By the way, any religious leader that claims he knows a day and a time, you should run from that dude and do not drink any Kool-Aid he offers you, okay? Dangerous. Because Jesus said only the Father knows. But I'm telling you, there is all kinds of prophecy. If you're paying attention, you can read it and go, whoa, look what's happening with Israel right now. Look what's happening with some of these nations in the Middle East. Look what's happening with our own nation as we back away from God's chosen people going all the way back to Genesis 12 when he said, I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse Israel. Church, I'm just saying, pay attention, be aware of the times. This is not a time to jump on the liberal bandwagon and be all anti-Israel. CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, doesn't matter what you're hearing there. They are still God's chosen people, and God still says, I will bless those who bless Israel. I will curse those who curse Israel. We are living in historic times, and the command is make the most of every opportunity. And by the way, regardless of the end times, today might be your end time. Have you ever thought of that? I mean, if you're over like 47, you're getting close. You know what I mean? (laughs) Joking. Seriously, though, we don't know. This could be your, you could be living in your end times. When was the last time you got a call from someone that so-and-so just passed away and you're like, I just saw them two days ago. Do we not experience this in our community almost weekly? Man, I just saw that person. Just ran into him in the store. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. We're we're commanded to make the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil, therefore, here's another negative command. We're almost done. Therefore, do not be foolish. Don't be foolish. Put off foolishness. But positive command, understand what the Lord's will is. Here again, Paul's saying you need to know God's will. And church, let me tell you, becoming a student of the word of God is how you know God's will. You don't have to say, well, what does John think about that? It doesn't matter what John thinks about that. What does my denomination think about that? It doesn't matter what your denomination thinks about that. It matters what God's will is, and he's spoken through his word. That's why I'm telling you, God's plan is for you to know his word and his will. This was not just given for a few religious leaders at the front to tell everyone else how to live, and you just believe me that it's there. You need to know if what I'm saying is actually in there or not. And thank God we live in a day and age where the Bible is so available to to the average ordinary person it hasn't always been this way did you know there haven't always been like the uversion app that hasn't always been around but it's it's there i mean just anybody can can have the word of god and you need to know it because we're we're commanded to understand the will of god Uh uh-oh uh-oh some of you showed up today and god is going to say through his word verse 18 here's another negative command put this off do not get drunk on wine Because of who you are in Christ, don't get drunk on wine. Let's talk about that for just a minute. He goes on to say, which leads to debauchery. And you're like, well, I've never heard debauchery. What is that? It's basically, here's the definition of that. It's just unbridled, sensual self-indulgence. You know, watch MTV for a half hour and you'll see debauchery. Go on spring break to almost any beach and you'll see debauchery. And, and, And basically, here's the command. Do not get drunk on wine. Put that off. Let's talk about that. I can feel the tension in the room already building. (laughs) Let's talk about this for just a second. Um, I grew up in a church, and from a background that that I'm going to just say went beyond the teaching of Scripture, in order to avoid all that, we, we, we thought we would help everybody avoid that by just adding to Scripture and saying any touching of alcohol at all is sin. 
And, and so I grew up being taught that and believing that, and, and then I started working with teenagers, and then I started preaching that, and I was like, all right, I got to find that in the Bible, where, where, where they've been teaching me all this my, my whole life. And then I start searching through Scripture, and I'm not finding anywhere where it says to consume alcohol is a sin. I was like, what? As a matter of fact, if you dig into it, you might actually find you could build a case biblically for having a drink of alcohol. Boy, it's got tense in here real fast. But, church, hear me very clearly. You just heard the word of God say to you, do not get drunk on wine. There's a very clear boundary. And to the issue of alcohol, I just want to say this. This is a, a subject churches as Christians like to argue about and debate and, and discuss. And I will just say this. I know people on both sides of this issue that love Jesus and have differing views on, on, on this whole alcohol question. And so let me, let me speak to that for just a minute. I know, I know Christians that say, man, I have seen what this did to my family. I lived with a dad who was an alcoholic. My parents were alcoholics. I saw the fallout. And by the way, Scripture does have a lot to say about the dangers of alcohol. And so there's something to be heeded in all of this. And so I know Christians that will say, or for me, like, like I'm just saying, there are people listening to me right now that you, you should never, ever for the rest of your life have a drink because you know where it leads. When, when one drink, it'll take you there. And, and I think as a church, we have to love and respect that is valid. But I also know people over here on the other side that also love Jesus and follow Jesus, and they say, I, I know I have the Christian freedom and liberty. I can consume wine. I can have a glass of wine with my meal, or I can have a beer every now and then, and I don't have to have three and four and five, and, and, and I'm not an alcoholic, and, and they love Jesus. And, and here's what I think is okay to say. We, we can agree to have differing views on this. But what you just heard in Ephesians chapter 5 is God clearly said, do not get drunk on wine. So I've heard, and young people, let me, let me speak to the young people for just a minute. I've heard young people make the case, well, Jesus, you know, he was at a wedding, and he even made wine, and which I believe is true, and I believe it wasn't the fresh grape juice. I believe it was the good stuff. That's why it was miraculous. He made it, but, and, and I, I think Jesus was okay hanging around people in that, in that environment, but I'm just telling you what Jesus was not doing was getting sloshed in the nightclub twerking with his friends, Okay? And if you don't know what twerking is, ask your 12-year-old when you get home, and they'll, they'll fill you in and give you the down low on what that is. And so I just think th th we need to have some discernment. Remember we just read that about don't live unwise, don't live foolish, put off foolishness. I think we need to have wisdom when we come to that issue and discernment and know there is a very clear boundary where God says if, if you're getting drunk on wine, it, it's out of bounds. It's improper. He says this, instead, here's a positive command, not just don't get drunk, that's, that's not just where he leaves it. He says, instead be filled with what? The Spirit of God. Verse 19, another positive command, speak to one another with psalms, with hymns, with songs from the Spirit. See, he's not just saying don't be drunk on, on wine. He's saying I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit. By the way, I just thought of this. I know some people that have done absolutely foolish things in the name of being drunk on a different kind of spirit. And I also have known some Christians that do some really wacky things over here on the other extreme and blame the spirit for that one too. And I'll just say this, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you never lose control of your mind. Either way, there is a very balanced place to live here in the middle where I live a spirit-filled life and I am in tune with God's will and with his spirit is alive and active inside of me. Be filled with the spirit. And then here's another positive command. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Hey guys, I'm going to beat up on the men for just a minute. This needs to be the theme verse of our worship teams and all of our campuses. We are commanded to sing from the heart to make music to the Lord. And I just want to harp on this for just a minute, no pun intended. Uh, I, I want to speak about this because sometimes when I get to be up front uh, working on the keys here and I can kind of look out over the people and I just kind of sense the vibe of worship, some days you can just really sense, man, God is in this place, he's moving. But sometimes I look around and I see people just standing here like this. You know what I think when I see someone just standing there like that and so often it's men? My first thought is I bet they don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And if that's true, then that's, you have total permission just to stand there like you're not alive on the inside because that's true of you. And we're just glad you're in the house and you don't have to sing. We won't put you on the spotlight. But I'm just saying, if you have been bought by the blood of Jesus, if he lives in your life, there ought to be some music going on in your life. 
There ought to be some times that you're singing in the shower, you know what I mean? And the family's like, stop singing, Dad. You're like, I can't, you know, <laughs> I'm singing. Anyway, anyway. Here's one more positive command. Always giving thanks to God. We're back to that whole gratitude to the Lord. For the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, here's, here's how I want to end our time. I, we just went through 20 verses, and Paul went in about 42 different directions with do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. Let me, let me try and sum all this up. This is not an easy passage of Scripture just to teach through and say, this is what he's saying, because he's saying a lot here. So here's how I'm going to sum this up. I want, I want to ask three questions. Two of them I want to ask to the Christians in the house, and then I want to come back to my unbelieving audience and ask you just one question, okay? Here we, here, here we go, to the, to the believers, to the Christ followers. My first question for you is just this. As we were going through that, and you kind of look at that Scripture dissected into the positive and negative side of things, was there anything that the Spirit of God just kind of nudged you about and said, that's you, we need to talk about that? Was there? Was there any conviction? And by the way, let me just point out the difference between condemnation from Satan versus conviction from the Holy Spirit of God. Condemnation says, because of your behavior, you, your identity is affected by your behavior. Because you do these things, that's who you are. That is not what the Holy Spirit says. The Holy Spirit says, this is who you are, therefore you should not do these things. Conviction says, I need to very specifically deal with this. Condemnation says, you're a horrible person. You should feel a lot of guilt and shame. That's not what I'm asking you to feel. And if you're hearing that voice right now, that's not your Father in heaven speaking to you. Conviction is where the Holy Spirit says, you know when he was talking about that sexual impurity thing? Let's, let's deal with that. You know when he was at that part about giving thanks and being gratitude, having, putting on gratitude? We need to talk about that. You've complained a lot this week. You know that part he was talking about Jesus, not twerking in the nightclubs, you know? Go look at your Facebook. We need to talk about that, okay? So that's where we're at. Was there anything that, that the Holy Spirit just kind of convicted you about and said, ooh, there it is. Then, then here's my, my challenge to you. If so, deal with it. Confess it. And you know what confession is, church? Confession isn't, I'm a horrible person. Confession is just where I agree with God. I call sin what God calls it. I call truth what God calls it. I call righteousness what God calls it. And I, and I live accordingly. Confess it. Repent. Know what Jesus, uh, the, the word of God says, 1 John, right? 1 John says what? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will what? Forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't have to be afraid to come to your father and confess. Lord, I agree with you. My life has been out of line with your will in this area of my life. And I need to deal with it. So just deal with it. That's my message to the Christians today is deal with it. Whatever God is saying. And then here's the thing. I wanted you to write these two words down because I want to connect them. Okay, here's my second question to the believers in the house. Does the world see my identity, write this down, the word identity in Christ through my behavior in life? What I want to do for the Christians is I want to connect for you this behavior, because that's what Paul's talking about here is a lot of behavior stuff. Put this on, put this off, do this, don't do that, okay? When the world views my life, do they see that my behavior is in line with my identity in Christ? And see, here's the problem, church. Here's the problem. When, you, when we as God's people who have this identity in Christ, when we go out and show the world something other than who we are, when we live and behave in such a way that contradicts our identity in Christ, what we're doing is we're taking the light and the life of Jesus and we're covering it up to a dark and dying world. And this dark and dying world that is in desperate need of the light and the truth that we have can't see Jesus in us. And instead what they see is a huge inconsistency. They see someone who claims to know and love and follow Jesus, but what they see in that person's behavior totally says the opposite. I mean, some of y'all, when you look down that list of the put off, I mean, that describes some of your Saturday nights. And it's not that, that God's saying, shame on you, you're a horrible Christian. It's saying, the world doesn't know what to think about Christ when they look at you. Because you claim something here with your mouth, but with your life you're living out something entirely different and the, the two aren't connecting. Who you are in Christ with how you're living in the world. And so to the church, that's my question for God's people, is when the world sees you, what do they see? My prayer is that when they see the people of this church, that they would see real, authentic people, not perfect 
People who still stub our toe, who still make mistakes, but who will own it, who will confess it and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I shouldn't live that way. People that are truly following after Jesus with, with, with all that they have. To the non-believers in the house, I told you I'd ask you one question, and here it is. I just want to ask this of you, because you've been able to sit here, and I'm not, you're not on the hook for any of these put on and put off things. My question to the non-believers is this. Are you ready to stand before the God who created you and be held accountable for all of the immorality in your life? Oh, that's a deep question. That's an abrasive question. I understand that. I'm not saying that yelling. I don't have a vein bulging out of my neck, and I'm not pounding on a pulpit or a Bible when I say that. I'm asking straight up. The day is coming that your life on this earth will end, and I'm asking when that day happens, and you stand before the God that deep down in your heart you know exists, are you ready to give an account for your life to that God? I want to take you back. It's not on the screen, but I just want to read it one more time. Verse 5. I went through it very quickly, but I want you to hear what Paul says. He says, no immoral. And by the way, that's you. That's me. You're not going to get graded on a curve that, well, you're better than Hitler was. You're better than Saddam Hussein was. That's not how Jesus Christ is going to judge you. You're going to get judged against the perfect standard of God's holiness. And if you so much as miss it in one area, one time, you are now labeled immoral before a holy God. And Romans 3.23 says that's all of us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I'm just asking, are you ready to stand before that Lord when he says things like this? No immoral, impure, or greedy person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. And then we, we read this in there too where Paul said this. He said that God's wrath comes on those who who are disobedient. And let me tell you that the danger in this and the, the tragedy in this, if I'm speaking to a non-believer who's hearing this and is ready to walk out the door saying, Psh, you can keep it to yourself, let me tell you the tragedy in this. God's wrath has already come. And he poured out all of his wrath and fury for your sin on his son, Jesus, who stood in the gap for you. The price has already been paid. There's no need for you to be separated from a holy God for all eternity because Jesus Christ made it possible for you to be restored back to God the Father. And for you to walk away from that lifeline, for you to hear that invitation and to walk away saying, no, thank you, that means the day is coming when you will stand before a holy God and you will give an account for every single time you have willfully, actively, or passively disobeyed his will. Are you ready for that? I, I pray not. I pray not. I pray that the Holy Spirit convicts you that today is the day to repent of my sin and my arrogance and my pride and to humble myself before a holy God and just to reach out and accept what he's already done on my behalf. And I would beg you, do not walk out of the doors of one of our locations today without speaking to, to somebody saying, I need that. I need that gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. I need it. Because we would be happy to help you connect that. Let's, let's, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this day that you've given to us. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. And I thank you for these people that you love. Lord, as we go through a passage of scripture like this that says so much and goes in so many different areas, it's easy to look at it and say, wow, it's just a, a bunch of rules. It's a bunch of do's and don'ts. But Lord, I pray that you would help us as, as your people not to lose sight of all of that behavior flows out of who we are in Christ. Help us to connect those dots in our life this week. Help the world to see Jesus alive in us and through us. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in the sound of my voice that has not yet received the gift of eternal life, I pray that today would be the day that their eyes are open and where they realize I am not ready to stand before a holy God and give an account for all of the junk in my life. And what a waste of the sacrifice of your son that would be. When Jesus already died in our place, your wrath was already poured out. What a waste it would be to reject that free gift of eternal life. Lord, my prayer is that today your spirit would be convicting the hearts of those in the sound of my voice who need Jesus more than anything else today. Lord, help them hear your voice saying, I'm not impressed with the fact that you've sat in church your whole life. I'm not impressed with the fact that you follow most of the rules. I'm not impressed with the fact that you can clean up and dress up and come to church and fit in. What I know, I see your heart and I see that you have never received me into your life. Convict them, I pray, Holy Spirit. Do what only you can do 
and, and we're trusting you for eternal fruit that comes out of this message today. We love you, Jesus. I pray that you'd bless the remainder of our service today as we worship you now with our giving. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. You can listen to more past messages at therescuechurch.com. If you'd like to share how God spoke to you through this message, we'd love to hear from you. Just send your stories to therescuechurch at hotmail.com. If this message has blessed you, you can support the ministry of the Rescue Church by giving online at our website under the Donate tab.